very good afternoon to dr anshu sharma sir and welcome rama pandey ma'am hello good afternoon thank you for the welcome i hope you can hear me yes sir you are clearly audible sir Smriti, uh, are you checking this sharing option? Yes, yes, it does. It does allow me to share my screen. Let me know when I should start. Uh, good afternoon, sir, and uh, good afternoon, Dr. Rama Pandey, and uh, good afternoon, Dr. Chu as well. Good afternoon, sir. Hope everything is fine. Your good wishes. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Shridharan sir. You are muted. Kindly unmute yourself, sir. Yeah. Good afternoon to all of you. Yeah. Good afternoon, Shridharan sir. Hi. Good afternoon, Ji. Good afternoon, all of you. Good afternoon, Dr. Anshu Smriti. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon, Ramaji. These are good excuses to see people, although we can't meet very often, but very good to see all of you. <laughs> uh, I'm meeting Smriti for the first time. Hi, Smriti, but I know your organization and your work really well, so pleasure. Hi. I'm sure. Thanks. Uh, I've, I've heard a lot of your conversations, though, so I know you like that, but I'm meeting you for the first time like this. Should I be um, sharing uh, the screen yet, or should I wait? No, we are just uh, going to some formalities. Uh, uh, Dr. Sridharan sir, shall we start with your due permission? Please, please go ahead. Uh, so, Yogita, you can uh, formally start the program so that we can finish in time. Yes, so, uh, namaste and good afternoon to honorable patrons, uh, speakers, delegates, and all the participants joined with us. Uh, today on the webinar of the topic of building urban resilience experiences and initiatives uh, this program is jointly organized by national institute of disaster management ministry of home affairs government of india and with the association of school of planning and architecture bhopal and institute of national importance ministry of education government of india uh, today we are also observing the world habitat day designated by united nations on the first monday of october every year uh, the day is also intended to remind the world that everyone has a power and the responsibility to shape the future of towns and cities. Today's webinar is also in compliance with Prime Minister's 10-point agenda for DRR number 8 and 9, which also state the importance of learning from past lessons and also building our local capacities. Today, we are blessed to have the support of our honorable patrons for this webinar. And I welcome uh, Executive Director of NIDM, Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal, sir, and also Professor Dr. N. Sridharan, sir, Director of SPA Bhopal. I also heartily welcome our eminent resource speakers of today's webinar, Dr. Anshu Sharma, co-founder of SEEDS, and Ms. Smriti Zukari, uh, Zukur uh, Zohari, uh, urban planner and a program leader from Society for the Promotion of Area Resource Centers. I joining them, I also welcome the conveners of this program, Dr. Amir Ali Khan, Faculty of Resilient Infrastructure Division, National Institute of Disaster Management, and Dr. Rama Pandey, Associate Professor and Head from SPA Bhopal. Today, uh, I, Yogita Garbyal, as a coordinator of today's program, welcome once again each and everyone and hope to have a great session today. Uh, now, I welcome, start with the inaugural session and welcome the convener, Dr. Amir Ali Khan, who is currently the senior faculty member at NIDM and is a trained civil engineer and an urban planner. His area of expertise include capacity building for earthquake risk mitigation, especially in urban areas, post-disaster reconstruction, rehabilitation, and mainstreaming DRR into development with the formulation of disaster management plans. So today we'll be uh, giving us the objective and also the introductory remarks for today's program. Over to you, sir, I welcome you. Uh, thank you, Yogita. For kind words and uh, good introduction. 
Uh, I join you in uh, welcoming uh, all the dignitaries, uh, Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal Sahib, as well as uh, Professor N. Sridhan Sahib, uh, Director S.P. Bhopal. And uh, I also take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor uh, Sridhan Sahib uh, for uh, kindly agreeing to collaborate with us on a very important day of uh, World Habitat Day today. And uh, we have chosen a very relevant and uh, very uh, important topic of uh, building urban resilience experiences and initiatives. So thank you, sir, for everything, uh, for guiding us uh, in making this and facilitating this uh, program. I also welcome all the participants, uh, as well as uh, both the uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Anshu Sharma and uh, uh, Mrs. Smurti, for kindly agreeing uh, to be part of this uh, deliberation today, this afternoon. And uh, as uh, Yogita mentioned that uh, we are observing this World Habitat Day. Uh, this is a UN day and uh, very themes have already been used, including the one theme on uh, safer cities, uh, cities and climate change, uh, planning for uh, urban future. So very themes related to urban development have already been discussed uh, this year. Uh, the official theme is accelerating urban action for a carbon free world related to uh, climate change, but uh, being in disaster management and uh, giving more uh, importance to resilience. Uh, we have selected this topic uh, as we know that uh, and what type of urban development we are passing through. Everyone is aware about this, so I'm not deliberating much on that, but uh, the only thing I want to highlight is resilience is the key for uh, sustenance of our developmental gains. So until we maintain whatever developmental gains uh, over a period of time we have uh, achieved uh, should should be there, should not go waste in any form with the impacts or disasters which are impacting us or the shocks which are coming in form of natural hazards. So this is the thing which we are discussing today that how to do it and what we have done and what uh, we have to do. So with this objective, we are organizing this uh, program on building urban resilience experiences and initiatives. Uh, basic objective is to sensitize, uh, especially those people who have been involved with urban development related activities uh, to make uh, cities sensitive for uh, disaster risk reduction as well. Uh, we, we, we are doing this uh, disaster risk reduction and urban development, but uh, what I can see is uh, there is uh, no marriage of these two disciplines up to very, very serious level. Uh, we are pursuing both these two disciplines separately. A lot of work is going on disaster management as well as urban development, but uh, we have to uh, bring these two disciplines very, very close so that uh, we can make uh, risk sensitive uh, urban development and uh, safeguard our uh, developmental gains, especially in critical infrastructure and other spheres of urban development. With this, I just conclude and uh, uh, take this upon to thank once again, uh, especially Professor Sridharan sir and uh, Dr. Rama Pandey, madam, for uh, kindly ag agreeing to collaborate and both these speakers for kindly agreeing to deliver uh, the main main discussion points this afternoon. Thank you. Over to you, Yurita. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, you rightly mentioned that disaster management in urban planning and urban resilience has to come together. Uh, now I would like to invite the, for the keynote lecture of today, uh, the patron of this program, uh, Professor Dr. N. Sridharan, sir. So, sir, uh, before sir starts, so let me give a brief bio of sir. Sir is currently the director of School of Planning and Architecture, Bhopal and is also the director uh, with the additional charge of School of Planning Architecture in New Delhi as well. He's a chairperson of the Education Standing Committee of the Professional Body of Institute of Town Planners India and one of the vice presidents of Regional Science Association India. Earlier, he was also the director of School of Planning Architecture Vijayawada and worked with School of Planning and Architecture New Delhi as a professor. Dr. Sridharan has more than 33 years of experience in the field of urban and regional planning and has published widely in the national and international journals in the field of urban governance and finance, peri-urban development, rural development, and spatial data infrastructure. Dr. Shri Dharan has been visiting researcher at the University of Cologne in Germany, in Germany, University of Florence, Italy, University of Paris, University of Amsterdam, and University of Twente, 
the Netherlands and International Institute of Ecology, uh, Dresden, Germany. His area of interest includes urban governance and finance, peri-urban development, urban uh, cluster planning, corridor development and urbanization, urban land markets, poverty and sustainability, and spatial data infrastructure. Sir has also been the member of many esteemed committees, like he's the technical member of Ministry of Panchayati Raj, Government of India, uh, Committee on Formulation of Planning Guidelines for Rural Areas, uh, technical member of Ministry of Rural Urban Government of India, and many more. With this uh, small words, I welcome you, sir, for your keynote address. Over to you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Ms. Yogita. It's really a great honor for us to do, along with uh, NADM, on this occasion of World Habitat Day, something to do with disaster and resilience. We are quite happy on the first day of the Habitat Day itself, we are starting this exercise and starting this uh, seminar. That's something great. We are still before the world starts on this, we are starting quickly. The second point, which I want to say, the UN Habitat, when they started way back in 1985, at the time also we have, have been associated with that directly, because uh, during the 1985 also we have been actively doing a lot of work in terms of JNURM and other things. And even to this day, we are doing something on smart cities and uh, disaster and resilience and all the things. So it's a quite uh, good opportunity for us to do this work. Now, again, I go back 1998, there were focus on safe cities. Now, if you go back and then see that how much of that safe cities are in relation to disaster and resilience, how much work we have done on this, we still have to do a lot of this in terms of assessing that how much of the 1998 to 2021, you know, we have to focus on this again. Okay, one. This time, this year, it is on accelerating urban action for a carbon-free world. Okay, though we are not uh, discussing anything on this today, but still, it's an uh, open issue because of climate change, because of SDGs, which are also related to disaster and resilience. Now, I just want to focus some of the uh, experts who are there. Dr. Anshu is there, Smitra is there and uh, Dr. Amma and also Dr. Uh, Amir Ali Khan, they should focus on certain important issues. When the resilience comes or the disaster comes and, uh, and associated with resilience, how do the marginalized sort taken care of? Okay, that's uh, something which still we are not yet doing or still we are not able to achieve certain aspect even for a small city within the country. So how do you address that issue of marginalized, especially related to shelter and related to space? Because we have seen in many of the coastal areas where I've been associated with, the first target is in terms of the disaster occurs that and the resilience to get it back to that normal or doing some kind of uh, building the resilience over a period of time. It's very, very difficult because the focus is not on marginalized, but it's on the city across. When the city across comes in, the dissemination to that level in terms of marginalize and make them effective, it's a real challenge for all of us as planners as well as for the disaster aspect of it. One. The second related to that resilience is also related to sustainable livelihood. Because you know, even during the COVID period, you now yesterday also I was talking to some people about the commissioner of Bhopal. We are saying still we are not able to, almost 20,000 families are still not into back into normalcy in terms of sustainable livelihood. Okay, now across India you can imagine what will be the impact of this and how to sustain that in terms of resilience, that is a big thing. The next aspect, why, what happened? In the master plan, we do talk about the disaster, we do talk about resilience, we do talk about but a direct peaceful effect. How do you come out with the land use plan related to resilience, related to disaster, and that to focus in terms of 
marginalized areas? What should be the focus? Because the land master plan, as well as smart city, as well as uh, any of the program like JNURM in the past, they all think in terms of land value capture. When the focus is on land value capture, the society itself or the social dimension of the disaster, as well as in terms of resilience, how to recoup them in terms of the normalcy, how to do them to over a period of time, sustain that resilience over a period of time, it's a big thing, a task, because that also includes funding. Now, we don't have across the country, we don't have some kind of insurance in terms of sustainable livelihood, how to do that, okay? At the city level, we are not equipped ourselves for that. So that should be a focus in the future. Because right from the human habitat year, that is 1985 onwards, they have been talking about shelter as a basic right. Can we bring resilience also as a part of the rights? And then bring it especially in terms of master plans, in terms of smart cities and all these aspects. That's a big focus that we need to attend. Probably NIDM can still do this from their level because it's under the act. Okay. Second, within that aspect, how do you bring in the town planning act as well as uh, other related acts, even the case of rural areas also, how to bring in this act as a part of the resilience program? That is something is uh, we still have not yet done, still not equipped ourselves for that or not even tried our attempt to do this kind of thing. Then coming to the different dimension in terms of carbon free and other thing. Now today morning only we are just discussing with some of the faculty member to do with a human habitat. Some students are presenting something on CP that they cannot place in Delhi. I would just ask the question, are you aware of what has happened in 1950s in cannot place? What has happened in 1970s, 1980s, and the 1990s? And now you are talking about metro. We started off, I mean, it's like a cycle, which will be started off with that initial period where it was a bullock cart going around in cannot place. And then we went into in terms of walkability. And then we shifted to something like uh, we have vehicles. And now we are going into metro. Now, during this period, of several decades, still we are not addressing that basic thing in terms of sustainability. Whatever the current thing is there, today it's maybe a good thing to, to talk about smart city, okay, we all talk about smart city. Tomorrow if something changes, okay, we change our attitude. What? Why can't we have a vision for resilience in terms of sustainability also? In terms of even for the master plan, we don't think about what is, we try to address the issue currently, but not about what is going to be 2050. So we try to tend all the things in terms of the current equations and then try to build the current equation and then over a period of time, try to snowball that over, let's say, five years, 10 years like that. And after that, we forget. So the a small example of what I told about is in terms of cannot place. And we never think in terms of what is going to be 50 years from now, what will happen? What kind of urban form? What kind of urban resilience? What kind of disaster that is going to come in Minto Road? Okay, we never think about it in terms of 20, 50 years onwards, nothing has happened. At least during my 30 years in and around the ITO, no, address have, no issues have been addressed to in terms of flood. Okay, water logging, it's a regular feature for 30 years, 38 years now. Okay, I've been seeing it, nothing has happened. So well, how to tackle this issue in terms of sustainability and how to do this in terms of uh, resilience across the, city, across the city with a focus on marginalized cities. I think these are all the main things which I want to focus on and probably uh, they will debate, I mean, the experts are here, they will try to do discuss something on this, deliberate on this, and then take it further. And uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, for the collaboration between NIDM and SPA Bhopal. I'm sure after signing our MOU also, which is also in the, prog uh, the process, and uh, we will take up more opportunities for us to do this work.
Thank you very much and uh, welcome to all the participants. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for addressing our participants and also to enlighten our participants regarding having a future vision uh, towards resilience. Uh, before starting with our, our technical sessions with our speakers, I also request if uh, Dr. Rama Omesh Pandey, ma'am, uh, would like to give just two, uh, two points for before we start for the inaugural. So, ma'am is currently the Associate Professor and Head of Environmental Planning Department from SK Bhopal. And she is an academician, researcher and administrator with more than 20 years of ex experience. And her area of specialization includes climate change, informed settlement planning, mainstreaming environmental concerns for both global and local level in spatial planning, social, ecological and climate change resilience and livability of the residential building environment. Over to you, ma'am, if you have some words to say. No, I will, I will sum up uh, later uh, after okay. listening to our eminent speakers. They uh, both both the speakers are uh, from uh, ground. They work with the people on ground, and they have first-hand experiences of building resilience uh, within community. So participants and we all are very eager to listen to to them. And I also, on behalf of SV Bhopal, welcome uh, both the speakers. Now over to you. Thank you so much, ma'am. So, uh, as I give ma'am said, we are all keenly uh, waiting for our speakers and to hear their experiences. So, for that, I first like to invite ma'am Smriti Zukur. She's practicing a uh, she's practicing urban planner, working with SPARC Spark and SDI. Uh, she has experience working in Asia and sub-Saharan African cities with Spark Society of for the promotional area of resource center which is uh, an affiliate for the Transitional Slum Dwellers International SDI Network, which spans over 20 countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. She is presently based in India and works to support federations on projects within the network of SDI on challenging urban planning practices in informal settlements. The network operates from the premise that organized communities of the urban poor are central to the generation of inclusive, resilient, and sustainable cities. SDI federations organize around daily savings, profiling and emulating their settlements and partnering with government to implement incremental upgrading of slums. Uh, so uh, Smriti Ma'am also works closely on the Know Your City campaign, which is mapping and creating digital footprints on community led informal settlement profiling. The KYC campaign supports partnership between local government and city. She engages nationally and internationally with training young to be the professionals to better understand mapping, designing, and planning practices, realities, especially within the limits of informality. Over to you, ma'am. And today, ma'am will be discussing. Uh, today, ma'am will be discussing on uh, some of the topics related uh, to the distortions of built environment. And over to you. I welcome you for your lecture, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for the very warm welcome. And I would like to take it forward from the keynote that Professor Sridharan has made and very rightly touched upon some of the very key issues. Um, and thank you for giving this opportunity to be here. Um, I'll just share my screen and put up my video if it's okay. And I'm just going to um, stir this discussion with use of visuals and a very short video just to um, probably take this in the right trajectory um, that I'm trying to talk about. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, ma'am, it's coming. All right. So I'll just play this video. Uh, it's about a global campaign that we've been running. And it touches upon issues that we're talking about.
All right, so I just wanted to um, show that video to, to really bring to this conversation saying, what is exactly the practice of built environment? And in some way, the decisions that are being made um, in the community of planners is not reflecting in the way that support systems and mechanisms that are required probably and not acknowledging that 70, 60 to 70 percent of houses and buildings are being built by people and and that it's time that we acknowledge that and the result why this why cities are the way they are today is because of all these contributions that individuals make and the decisions that all of us make as individuals and uh, very rightly said in the beginning that we use this term resilience a lot and in the nutshell we understand that it means about the elasticity or the ability for somebody to be able to bounce back in case of a disaster. Most of the times when disaster happens, it affects more or less everybody the same. But in a reality where we are talking about, you know, on an average, 40% of the city is living in informality. Um, and we are really talking about the bottom 10 to 30% of the pyramid. The ability or somebody's resilience really depends on which side of the line we are in this picture. And lastly, we, we all, we, a lot of us are from in between these two lines, but it, it really depends on some of these things. Um, we are talking about in a situation of a pandemic where the norm requires for social distancing, but a lot of people are living in 10 by 10, 20 by 20 houses uh, where there is rarely scope to, to, um, to follow some of these standards. And the, the reality today is that we're talking about built environment and resilience and use of materials. On the left that you see is an image that I picked up in Dharavi. It's a facade that of, of a slum, which looks at three generations of people building over time, building around materials that work for them, uh, building the way they are able to finance and what budgets they have. And if this is informal, and this is what is not so much acknowledged, on the right hand side is actually a relocation site, which is 12 years down. And I don't see where, where what we are doing uh, by taking decisions formally. And I don't know if it reflects very rightly the right practice of designing and planning. So the question that I'm trying to really raise is that are we distorted in this whole um, I mean, are we distorted with standards? Because uh, when we have instruments to work on the ground, often some of these things do not work and plan doesn't know how to go about it. Now, this is another image on the left hand side of an informal settlement where we see um, this huge challenge of light and ventilation. And we see that informality builds like that. But again, on the right hand side are these tall structures which are built formally. But I don't really see where there is a change in the habitat or where if there is real change in the quality of life that people are living. This is on the inside. There is still so much that we have to learn from the way buildings are being built in the past. Now, what I'm trying to drop on is that this is a practice that we've been seeing often, and it also translates the way development plans are done. Now, not to go there talking about what we do with development plans, which reflects on the existing land use plan. This is an existing land use plan of, uh, of a ward in Mumbai. On the left-hand side that you see are locations of slums, and these are huge slums with big numbers and uh, densities, and they've been there for about more than maybe two generations. And on the right-hand side that you see is um, the existing land use plan. And we can clearly see that there is there's lack of acknowledgement of what the reality is today. And, and the same then reflects in the way decisions are make, being made. Now, what I'm trying to talk about it is that the, the reason that some of these discussions don't go ahead or that it doesn't translate into a real action is because there is often very rarely information available at the granular level. And that disaggregated data is very, very rarely available. And it requires, in order for resilience or adaptation programs to happen, it really requires for the cities to work at the municipal level together with the residents 
to be able to use that information for real action when there is a challenge or when there is a disaster. So this practice of settlement profiling that we often use is basically for community led data collection and being able to map um, the challenges and then talk together with the councillors, with the local municipalities to then scale it up for actual action. We've recently worked on a very large uh, program with the World Bank, which looked at eight cities and five uh, countries, and we looked at mapping all the very vulnerable uh, areas in some of the cities that we had picked up, which we said were hotspots because they had this real serious challenges of habitat, uh, maybe on land, some of them are in water. And uh, we've looked at doing, uh, looking at community led data and priorities that are set by communities and then slowly going up digital in order to aggregate that data for the city to understand what the priorities are and what is the need of people. Um, we looked at very challenging areas because when you work in more challenging areas, it becomes very easy to scale it up because the power of resilience is not to do those small, cute little projects that work in one site and may not work in other, because we are really talking about a large scale and a large community of people that it impacts and that really are very vulnerable. So it requires us to come up with standards and protocols that works for everybody. So each country had picked up uh, areas that work for them uh, where there are challenges and that they thought was a potential to uh, pick it up. So in, in Mathare, in, in Nairobi, there is uh, there are many, many dense settlements and they've recently done a special planning area, which is actually to look at can there be standards and norms that work for informality, that uh, the normal formal systems and planning does not address and these standards may not always work for informal settlements without compromising on the crucial elements of emergency services and the ability to be able to do things when there is a disaster. Uh, in Accra, they've looked at larger settlements which actually are on reclaimed land. So this is, we're talking about huge settlements that are there on the coast. And there are serious issues with basic infrastructure that just cannot be addressed uh, by systems that we normally use in design. Uh, Freetown uh, looked at you know, their strategy that they had worked in 2014 with the Ebola outbreak to see why a similar strategy of dissemination and working together with municipalities has not worked during this pandemic and what hence could be done in order to um, contain and, and work around this pandemic. Uh, in Dharavi, we looked at, you know, in 2007, we've done an entire mapping, but to work again to reassess that plan in 2021 to understand what were the issues specifically during COVID and that has not worked and what were the factors and if there is a, a potential to, to reestablish and to work with municipalities to see that what can be done that people have lesser challenges and not wait for another pandemic to come because a lot of these problems are not that they were not there, that they were always there and we've been working on them gradually and cities have been working on them but now what's happened is that it's exacerbated the situation and the pandemic has clearly shown that there are these serious gaps and that they need to be addressed without waiting. Um, so an entire mapping of every single infrastructure, the quality of the infrastructure, the level of service and what really needs to be done um, in order to upgrade that infrastructure was done. So essentially, if I talk about in the nutshell, what we see in a summary of what we learned in this process is that we are still way, way far behind uh, in trying to address even challenges of basic services and that it really requires the cities to build infrastructure and it requires to work together with communities in order to address uh, some of these issues. And we've done a pilot with one of the wards, uh, P North in Mumbai, which has got very serious challenges in terms of uh, the terrain itself, because there is hills on one side and then it leads to the coast on the other side. And it has one of the highest slum population um, in, in the city. And we'd come up with a good 50, 60 indicators uh, that then can be put together in a more simplified form to be not so technical and work together with the local board office and their all the departments to see what the problems are in each of these settlements 
and how can we work together with the clustering of these settlements so that the finances and decisions that are being made at the world level reflect in some of um, in, in addressing some of these challenges uh, because we are talking really about uh, huge uh, challenges in uh, service delivery and uh, how can then we work together with the governments to make and to plan investments better so basically i'm trying to um, talk about the responsibility of a community to work together in the built environment and if there is an opportunity for us to support the way cities are being built to support this community of people who are vulnerable and they have been traditionally building cities and building lives and building the way they live over the last so many generations and that affordability is once it is the bottom line and that if we do not work around solutions that are affordable and we cannot be talking about um, you know scaling some of these solutions so how can we talk about improvement refinement and upgrading by acknowledging uh, really the reality of what the challenges are today on the ground and how this community can actually work together with people in order to build the solutions that come from people and that can be refined by our technical knowledge and by our support uh, in order to help them build better. So when we talk about uh, building codes and uh, norms and standards which have been built for a real good logic, but what if some of them are not working in reality for this large community of people? Can we look at alternative standards and work together with communities to see that we do not change everything overnight because that's not how it works by converting slums into greenfield sites. But if there is a way around to make short term, medium term and long term plans to engage with informality so that slowly and gradually it gets embedded within the city. So um, I would leave it at that and I would. Um, I would look at how we can stir this conversation forward um, later with the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Smriti ma'am, for yeah. uh, give. Thank you so much for uh, giving a brief uh, through your presentations, and how to engage our community and build resilience with them, and also to help them uh, through our technical expertise. So thank you with this. Uh, now we'll move ahead with the second technical session. Uh, Smriti ma'am, if you could end this pro yeah. uh, presentation. So yes, so uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Anshu Sharma. He's a co-founder of Seeds. Anshu sir is trained as an urban planner at the School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi, and did his doctoral research in global environmental studies at Kyoto University, Japan. Over his last 26 years, sir has worked extensively on disaster risk and climate emergency issues and has coordinated community-based action projects, trained practitioners, led interagency efforts, and conducted research. He has also served as an advisor and consultant to numerous government, non-profit, UN, and funding agencies, helping them to plan, implement, and evaluate their programs. He has an abundance of ideas and has a clean interest in system thinking, innovations, and capacity building within a humanitarian sector. A, prof a professional trainer, he has been driving force behind SEED's frontline disaster trainings and is a global tutor of Oxford Brookes University. Anshu sir has also pioneered initiatives such as Disaster Preparedness Innovation Lab in Bangladesh and Climate Schools in Sikkim. With these words, I welcome you, sir, and over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, it's a great privilege being here. Uh, Major General Bindal, uh, Professor Sridharan, Dr. Rama, uh, Dr. Ramir Ali Khan, uh, my colleagues on the panel. Uh, Smriti ji has made a very nice uh, presentation. I think that sets the tone really well. What I will do is I will uh, try to pick the thread from, from there and I will try to be very brief. Maybe in five, seven minutes, I'll try to share some of the work we've been doing at Seeds but more from a lens of disaster preparedness and response. And uh, that is uh, the additional lens I'll try to bring. And then maybe I'll stop with a question that, that bothers me as we go about doing this work. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully we'll have some, some time left to be able to 
debate and discuss that uh, amongst the panel and maybe more time for the q and a to happen so i will just go ahead and try to share my screen i hope technology supports which it often doesn't if you can see my sir. screen do let me know it's perfect oh, visible, sir. great thank you so much so so i start this from uh, many years ago this is a uh, an image from a slum, which is uh, very close to where NIDM's office used to be at ITO uh, till recently. And this, this is a slum that used to exit, exist inside the Yamuna riverbed. They were inside the embankments. They would get flooded uh, every year. And uh, this is in the late 90s, many years ago. And this was the first project uh, that uh, I was a part of uh, and SEEDS was, this was a project anchored by the National Center for Disaster Management, uh, which later grew into being the National Institute of Disaster Management. Professor Amir was uh, part of this program uh, at that stage. This was on urban risk reduction, a first project on urban risk reduction in India at that time. And why I show this was that as I as I explained in the context, this was a community that was very frequently hit by floods. When we went there to run this program, we assumed that their biggest problem in terms of disasters and development would be flooding. But they did. They told us that no flooding. They know how to deal with the period of the year is known. They've been seeing it for over 23 years that they had been settled there. And they said our bigger problem is fires because in the months of March and April, when it's really hot and dry, many of them used to recycle waste material. There would be fires that get ignited and they spread very fast. And since they were in the riverbed, there was no fire tenders that could come in and there was no way to fight these fires. So eventually a lot of things happened in that program, but one small pilot project on the ground was the setting up of this community fire post where the local group mobilized themselves. Uh, there was a, the water table was really high. So there was a bore uh, well that was uh, set up there. A little genset was put, a pump was put, and this group could fight fires. They could assemble pipes and they could fight fires within the settlement. And for me, although I had just emerged from college, uh, having formally learned urban planning, but this was a very different lesson on how Communities need to ro play a role in the planning of their settlements, in the management of their settlements, and in building resilience uh, in their settlements. This, this looks pretty rural, but this is actually peri-urban Patna. And later on, uh, we've gone ahead and done various kinds of things and, and projects that are based on community action planning towards resilience building. This is where a community gets hit, hit by floods repeatedly again. And the problem is that the kind of warning that they receive, you know, where either they receive a meteorological warning, which says that there'll be 200 millimeters of rainfall in the next 48 hours, or they receive a warning, which is based on river monitoring, which says that 200,000 cusacks of water is being released from the headworks upstream uh, this morning at eight o'clock. Now, a, a cusack is, um, most of you would know, but still a cusack is a cubic foot per second, which literally translates into 28 liters per second. That multiplied by 200,000 is being released uh, 70 kilometers upstream from where I am this morning at 8. What does it mean for me? Honestly, even I can't figure that out. So what we've tried to do here is we try to map the inundation that will happen. We try to convert it into what level of water will be achieved at a particular location. And we try to engage with the community and tell them, hey, this is what's going to happen. This is where your water levels will be by this much time this evening. And so you need to take action. So while I had learned a lot of scientific material on and tools and techniques on planning, uh, this is this is what we actually end up doing to make it usable to people. Uh, this is an image from a climate school in Leh, uh, where we worked after the 2010 uh, flash floods. This is local children and youth trying to understand what would happen if a lot of water comes into their settlements, and what would happen if the if this if the spring water 
you know the early melting of the glacier which is the basis on which very quick sowing can happen and harvest can be done before it freezes up again what would happen if that water reduces in its trickle this is an image from we have a program that runs in small towns in the hills uh, this image is from uttarakhand near karn prayag where we try to work with local children again an extension of the climate schools where children can learn how to set up and run a basic weather station and try to understand what weather warnings mean for them what long term climate change can mean for them this is another uh, weather station of this kind uh, in sikkim in gangtok these are schools running weather labs and weather stations in Gangtok, taking readings, understanding the science, and informing their families and their communities about what's to happen. This is an image uh, from East Delhi. We uh, we run a program on school safety with government schools uh, in Delhi, and here these children had earlier been making. You know, we do this mapping exercise, uh, and very simply, and for making it fun, we call them. Makhi Machar and Kachra maps, where children go around the neighborhood, around their school, and they map where they see garbage, where they see flies, where they see mosquitoes breeding, and then they try to understand what underlying risks come out of these issues. But for fun, what we were trying to do is to bring in a little bit more of uh, tech into it, and they were flying this drone to figure out what are the inaccessible places there are certain inaccessible rooftops where water gathers. There are certain overhead tanks which are without their lids and they were trying to uh, map. So the basic exercise was children learning how to do maps and trying to read risk and build resilience based on that. This again is from a gang talk and this uh, specific image is from Jorthang, a program that we We've been running in Sikkim on resilience again, uh, this time with earthquakes in mind. This is the uh, then Secretary of Disaster Management, Land and Revenue, Mr. Tashi, who's actually talking to community groups. This is happening in a community fair, and we are talking about non structural mitigation. How, in an earthquake, things fall within houses, even if the building may not collapse. Falling hazards cause a bulk of the injuries and how those can be mitigated. This is from one of our projects in Myanmar. Again, with models, we are trying to make communities understand uh, where their risk. This was a cyclone prone township uh, near the Erawadi Delta and how uh, risk comes into their lives and how they can deal with it. Uh, these are a few glimpses of something that we hold very core to our work and our thinking on resilience that communities should be involved. They should be at the center. They should lead the planning and action on the ground. Right? So these are on ground interventions. And what I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides is a few things where we've been trying more recently to match technology. How now, now the question comes at if you don't want to uh, start from technology, if you want to start from the ground up, where do you jump from community action plans to more of formal urban planning, the kind of master plans that we prepare, the kind of city disaster management plans that we prepare? So I'll share with you some of our more recent work, which started off from Orissa uh, in 2019. Uh, there was a cyclone called Fawny in May, and uh, and what we what we started learning and seeing more carefully is that within within vulnerable communities also there are many variations there are a few families that are hit harder than others so what we are doing here is we are doing what we call a building detection model with high resolution satellite imagery uh, we identify the different roof types that we can see we try to read into those and say, OK, if this is a thatch roof, it must be having weak mud mortar walls or bamboo and mud walls. It must not be having a, a strong foundation. If it's a tin sheet roof, then it is probably somewhere in between on the scale of vulnerability. And then you can start breaking it down on a single sloping tin sheet roof, on a hill, hipped, hipped roof, um, on a tiled roof, on and then onwards to uh, flat slab roofs. So the roof can actually tell you a lot. Uh, you can, besides the building, look at the size of the roof and all the sizes of roofs that are in that cluster. Is it a very dense cluster? You know, very telling imagery that we just saw uh, in the presentation, uh, you know, 
Uh, so where do various uh, scales of vulnerability fit within that? I think the title of that uh, image was scenes, uh, you know, of uh, contrast or something like that, that Smriti was showing us. That's what we try to see within a community itself. And that's how you can disaggregate uh, risk. You can find out which families will be hit hardest, whether in a flash flood or in a heat situation. Uh, even for heat waves, you can simulate. Similarly, for earthquakes, you can simulate. Very interestingly, in some of the work we are doing in Dehradun right now, you know, it's so uh, amazing that the same family and the same house, which could be a thatch or a plastic sheet roof, the kind that Smriti was showing us, uh, in a riverbed or next to a river bank is very highly prone and vulnerable to flooding. But when you talk about earthquakes, the same detection model, but their earthquake risk is lower because all that is going to fall on their head is a tarpaulin sheet and, and its frame. So how vulnerability to us of a structure can flip looking at the kind of a disaster that you are considering. Finally, what what we aim to see, uh, this is something we're trying to do in Chennai, but what we aim to see is how do you bring together this social dimension of risk and the ecological and structural dimensions of risk to see it in a composite manner. And where I would like to end is, uh, you know, this dilemma of balancing a people centric approach with a cutting edge technology approach. Of course, they need to coexist, but we all would know those of us in practice would certainly know that it's not easy to do that. The departments that deal with this are different. The stakeholders uh, approaches are different. The science is different. And the question remains that how do you bring together the mindsets, the policies, the skills and the tools in the people who act to be able to bridge this gap and to make this work together? So uh, let me let me stop here. And as I said, the the idea is that we should be able to have more time uh, to to discuss this uh, and this and any other questions that our participants may have. Uh, so I'll pause here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you so much, uh, Sharmadi. It's it's a wonderful presentation. You have uh, started uh, from the very basic basics. And uh, so, what is what is your take? How how to go ahead uh, and uh, how to do this blending? And uh, what is the ultimate? In my opinion, is that unless uh, whatever tools you have developed, either uh, artificial intelligence or uh, those uh, high tech things like imageries and GIS and all those mapping things, unless you involve the communities, uh, basically everything is revolving around communities like uh, Snooty also highlighted the same thing. So how to blend these two things? Because on one side you have the costly things, on the other side you have those low cost thing as, as we did in uh, that action planning with Nabil. So this is this is the thing. So what is your take? How, how to blend uh, these, these two things and uh, make a perfect uh, combination to reduce the vulnerability and uh, Build that resilience, the much needed uh, buzzword. Sorry, I mean, I missed that. Are you posing the question to me? Yes, oh, because okay. you are, you are, this is in continuation and this yeah. is my remark. Yeah. Well. <laughs> no, I, I think, no, a very valid question. And, and I certainly must confess, I don't have a clear answer because this is the, I mean, it's a similar note on, on where I, where I also was trying to end that. You know, when we work in practice, when we work on the ground, and a, since we are we are speaking in the uh, ambience of the NIDM, the virtual ambience of NIDM, I, I, if I speak institutionally in the governance system, then the language we are able to use below the district level is a, is a very easy language because at that point, the uh, issue of disaster risk management, resilience, climate change adaptation does not bother us. There is a problem that people are facing. We ask them what the problem is, and that's where a conversation starts. Very often, I think Smriti will, will uh, agree with this. Very often, you know, the conversations are, are around a good house. So, what does that mean? 
then the uh, the you know then it starts coming okay it should not drip you know the people face a lot of problems when they see uh, during the rains the water is coming in with newer materials stepping in there are more problems of heat during the summers people don't really talk about earthquakes sometimes they talk about water logging they don't really talk about flash floods they talk a lot more about these day to day what we may see as inconvenience and i think they are a great starting point because from there we can weave things together it really doesn't matter whether it's climate change adaptation or it's mitigation or it's disaster risk reduction right it's it's about servicing problems that people face and how we as uh, as literally as social consultants make that happen for them we hit a roadblock the moment we go upwards of a district level because then it happens ये तो क्लाइमेट चेंज का इशू है आपको मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ एनवायरमेंट फॉरेस्ट एंड क्लाइमेट चेंज से बात करनी पड़ेगी अगर आप द मोमेंट यू मेंशन सी लेवल राइज एंड यू नो इनडेशन हैपनिंग बिकॉज ऑफ हायर टाइड्स इन द कोस्टल एरियाज बट अगर हम बोलते हैं कि नहीं साहब इनको हीट की भी दिक्कत हो रही है हीट वेव इज अ डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट इशू वहाँ तो होम मिनिस्ट्री आएगी और सब स्लम को इम्प्रूव करना है दैट्स एन अर्बन डेवलपमेंट इशू अगर सर्विसेज की बात तो यू नो देन वी गेट कॉट इन अ लूप शुड बी बी टॉकिंग टू द म्यूनिसिपैलिटी आर वी टॉकिंग टू द अर्बन डेवलपमेंट डिपार्टमेंट आर वी टॉकिंग टू एमएचए और आर वी टॉकिंग टू द मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ क्लाइमेट चेंज सो दैट्स वेयर आमिर भाई दैट्स वेयर वी गेट स्टक सो व्हाट व्हाट वी नीड टू रियली फिगर आउट इज दैट व्हाइल देयर इज कंसेंसस एट द कम्युनिटी लेवल हाउ डू आर वी एबल टू मैप इट हाउ डू वी मेक इट रिलेवेंट फॉर द Let's see the master plan. We recently saw the Delhi one. Uh, so I'll pause here, Professor Amir. Over to you. No, 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 no. You, you, you can't be left alone like that. Uh, there was a question posed by Professor Sridhar in the beginning. Why we are not able to fix the ITO of uh, water locking? <laughs> and it is uh, you, you. Honestly uh, speaking, and... it is super simple to fix. <laughs> <laughs> so why why 30 years more than 30 years at least uh, we joined i think in 93 since then uh, we are also part and parcel of the same system and seeing the ritual of water logging almost every year okay let me take one stab and we are fortunate enough that professor shivaran is still uh, in this session i was i was kind of half afraid that he'll be having a very busy schedule and he may have left after the uh, inaugural so i'll i'll just put in one sentence and i'll look to him for guidance as all yes we are looking for that he, yeah. he's a teacher and he always will be uh, for for definitely me amir but uh, so one take is you know your question reminds me that recently someone uh, in the context of work said that you know for us know how is not really that that bigger problem we have the know how here what works and what we need to crack is the know who you know so the, so when i talk about the when i think about the problem of water logging in ito my problem is who's going to do this it's very simple you need recharge pits you need pumps you need a protocol that when it's going to happen how will we you know act quickly so that people don't get stuck i think it's very very simple to do i think it's not even a very costly affair the city can very easily afford it my my thinking stops where i say who's going to do it and and that's where as i said earlier my institutional web uh, you know starts uh, becoming very daunting so i need to stop here uh, amir i think we should look to professor shridharan for for light on this yes no idea i i want to you are an expert in this field so you have to come out <laughs> okay one the second point as you rightly pointed out that issue it's a institutional conflict okay now we have so many the uh, uh, institutions that come into as you say it's a web or i'll put it in the way more in terms of contestations who is doing the work and who is doing not doing the work because we don't have an institution who is responsible for what purpose in terms of delivery okay it's very good to do the planning but when it come to implementation and it go to the delivering to the people okay that's where the question comes in and especially in terms of right from the master plan to everything we don't have a question in terms of okay whether you are delivered it or not at what level and how do you sustain it over a period of time now in a places which are public spaces or public places it's a nobody's game nobody wants to touch that particular aspect 
okay it becomes pwd it becomes a municipal corporation ndmc municipal corporation or something else or that so the fixing the thing we had something like a governance okay at different levels we have governance system we never talk about water uh, as a ward level or mahalli uh, what you call uh, mahalla level which have been talking about from uh, 74th amendment to this day but unless you fix that in terms of this and then make the people participatory in terms of uh, monitoring as well as uh, regulating the whole development process that is uh, neither the whatever we see in ITO it's going to be replicated everywhere for the future so this has to be addressed from the that level which is mahalla mahalla level as well as in board level unless we do that i think it's very difficult to address the second point related to that probably uh, a madam may try to tell us because in spark they have done excellent work at the same time we cannot replicate it somewhere else what is that thing see when you talk about i'm relating it to the master plan because that's my own uh, area and the field when you talk about social fabric the social fabric is totally dishandled i mean not handled properly because there's now no sociologists exist in land use planning very rarely you come across a social planner who is doing something to do with this and integrate it whenever they talk about master plan that was mostly in terms of social reengineering we happened right way back in 1962 in delhi and also in Mumbai, as well as in um, most of the metropolitan cities, as well as now it is being <coughs> sent it across to the small cities as well. What kind of social cohesion? What kind of social conflict that exists? And uh, when you commit with that of land use planning and addressing the issue in terms of economics, like middle income group, EWS, now we have the EWS for everything also so and middle income group and high income group and all the thing then the social fabric is totally dismantled how do you address that issue especially this exists even in dharavi it exists in uh, other places okay even in jaipur slums also it exists even in chennai it exists everywhere it exists and how this conflict within the society within especially in the slums in terms of social conflict comes in and how to have bring in them in terms of resilience yeah thank you i think um i think the 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 entire community because when we say uh, social fabric or when we talk about social issues i'm not an expert on the subject but from what we've understood is that um people it really depends on the nature of the city also and there are these different hierarchies within a particular community. It could be religious basis or it could be within a particular community itself. But what really happens is that uh, for generations when people live together, they, there is a form of social resilience that comes together within communities. And the same thing reflects when the pandemic hit, especially with the example of Dharavi, uh, that the, the point that people are living together itself is a unity and that itself is a recognition of its own uh, self in the society. And when that is normally um, distorted or when that is normally conflicted and when they are moved or rehabilitated, especially the way we are looking at um, slum free cities and the way cities have been working on. And when people are not there from the beginning in that design, what happens is that uh, there is social disarticulation and that then reflects in the operation and maintenance in the way the buildings then eventually become and in their inability to be able to understand this transition from informal to formal. So I think uh, the when when people start coming and living together in a particular community or in a particular settlement, that fabric itself, um, you know, has this inherent resilience within that social fabric. So, so the idea to work around them or to with them is to not disturb that fabric. So even when in, in Mumbai, like uh, when we did MUTP, uh, you know, relocating 60,000 families, it was a huge task. Uh, and uh, in that collaboration and the policy of the World Bank was to, you know, relocate them. But the entire relocation was done uh, voluntarily from people moving together as clusters within the same social unit the way they wanted. And if we do or we go against that, 
uh, and disturb that. So we see the implications of that in the resilience also, in, or rather in that adaptation. I don't know if that if that addresses what you are trying to ask. So. Okay, uh, because still it's a big questions which so far we are not able to address that issue properly. I just wanted to ask a question, and then I, I'll uh, I'll open it. I mean, you can take to other thing because I have a lot of things to question. Even Anshu <laughs> also talk about edge technology, so I want to talk about that. When uh, please, please, sir, you you can pose some questions to Anshu as well. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is it okay? Uh, please, please go ahead. Uh, Anshu, we were also talking about that uh, balancing the people centric approach to, with that of the cutting edge technology, uh, which is very difficult. You said, yes, I do agree. It's very difficult to say, but see, especially after 2000, or even if you say 1995 onwards, if you see that technology has been adapted by the people themselves, say, for example, I was doing some of the work in uh, the disaster areas of uh, Chennai after the uh, tsunami comes. Okay, after the tsunami came, I was in one of the fishing areas. Okay, suddenly one of the ladies uh, they were working on this, and then in terms of distribution of some food and distribution of other things and all. Oh, it's a, she started uh, crying and say, "I don't have anything. We lost everything." And suddenly when the uh, Meet was, a meeting was going on. She picked up her mobile technology and then she said that, okay, you go there into some other place for that fishing and then that area. So I thought even in the disaster also, the technology does work for the poor as well, one. Second, I, I did a survey of almost like 800 uh, drivers of uh, Ola and uh, this one, I already call Uber in Delhi. Okay, before I shifted to Bhopal, I've been asking the question, okay, who taught you this? How do you do that? Do you have a capacity building? Do you have you trained anything? In fact, out of these 800 people, almost 750 of them said, we don't have any kind of training. They just call you and then, and then say, you isko press karo, isko press karo, then the map will start working and you experiment online. And then fortunately, they know much better than as a planner. They know which area, what area they can open up the map much better through the mobile technology, which even I had to use my son. Okay, please do this for me. So we are totally as a planner. We don't know much before this, whereas those people are much aware of that. In fact, the technology similarly, we tried to use that in uh, Vizag during the disaster. The first time when the disaster occurred, Almost 20,000, 25,000 people died. Next time, and they use the technology through that, uh, what you call uh, citizen science, as well as through that awareness about this whole disaster through mobile technology, which is still using in terms of even the Mumbai also, they are using this technology. When they disseminate the information prior in adv prior advance uh, this thing system, okay, they are able to use that and we brought down the total death to almost 1820 within two years, within three years, in the second disaster in Vaisak. So if the technology does help provide it, you give them the information how to do it, how to use that. Okay, so that's something very, very important. Unfortunately, I was with uh, IRS for one of the meeting. They still they are not able to get about one meter, even though we have now the IRS two, IRS three has come. Even that has not been disseminated to the local level where we can do this. Still, there is something secretive about that whole thing. Once you bring that to the local level, ward level, mahal level, all these things can be done very easily with the technology. Okay, thank you. Dr. Anshu Sharma, please. No, thank you, Professor uh, Shiran, and thank you, Professor Amir. Uh, I think I, this is this is an amazing session. I can see that there are more than 150 participants. It's a very tight, just uh, 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 and and share with you the takeaways that have emerged very very quickly in this. At least for me, I think one, as Professor Shidaran says, the the 
people themselves are driving technology and they are making use of it where we are falling short is how do we help them scale up and plug in you know whether it's the irs uh, what kind of remote sensing can come in what kind of ai models can come in i think urban planning has a lot of catching up to do with the way technology has moved and people have adopted it so let's figure that out in coming times and break that down i think that will be very useful for all our participants to also you know uh, keep in mind and see how we can all work together towards this the second thing that uh, i take away is you know about power to people if you actually give them the power they have the ability to do a lot on their own very often in the urban planning domain from our high platforms we don't trust them i think what smriti shared and what spark has done is a classic example and as i think professor shridharan was uh, pointing out many of these good works whether it's spark or seeds many others doing work they remain stuck as pilots or a few pilots because that institutional ladder for this to climb and spread uh, does not happen as easily as it needs to and the third takeaway from me uh, it was a, i think a very useful question on why ito floods and why we've not been able to solve it uh, and uh, i think most of you have uh, you know are familiar with delhi and have been to the india habitat center which was i think a very visionary thing by the architect joseph allenstein when it would have been in like any other institutional area you know where i'm sitting right now in rk puram there were i think six odd plots different institutions and here's somebody with a vision who said that you know if you combine your land and you combine your services and have a common governance there is enough for you and for the rest of the city and you know we all benefit from that we there's a club there are there's food there's theater there's culture there's conferences and all that happen and if someone would come forward and do the same in ito of the 10 odd organizations institutions that are part there if there can be a common ownership because all of us suffer with the flooding can there be a platform created where we jointly address this the technology is not difficult it's the institutional uh, coming together which would hold the key so with these three takeaways for me uh, professor amir i've taken note of these i think it's been a really useful and a very tightly governed conversation so thank you so much for that i hand this back to you and the uh, only thing from my side is that the acceptance whatever you have said uh, among the planning community so uh, we have to first realize that uh, we have to accept something which is we are not doing right now uh, like uh, you mentioned about uh, artificial intelligence and all those things whatever you have said that uh, and incorporating them into our actions like in master plans master plans and the existing knowledge uh, i think there is a gap like uh, in case of delhi uh, most of the examples from delhi because we are located in delhi and we have studied delhi in thread beer uh we have that uh, microzonation map available which is uh, the first st another step ahead and i don't know how how effectively we have used that microzonation map into our uh, land use planning so this is one thing which uh, we have to accept and incorporate those challenges so uh, i think uh, uh, with this we just uh, go for closing and request uh, professor sidran to uh, go for a uh, closing remark sir may request uh, rama sir no no can we take up one or two question from the participants because we okay. Sure. so okay okay so you uh, yes, uh, you may raise so, uh, so one I'll... question from a participant to smriti ma'am is that uh, from rakesh kumar building codes and specifications are not made for informal settlements such as slums so one of your slides says we are not concerned with what we do in my opinion this is the main cause of starting from planning level any more comments on this yeah i think when they say that they are not concerned about what they do it's not about concern it's that i think they are saying that they are able to do what only works for them in their affordable zone because uh we need to also i mean i think we would agree that a lot of solutions that is built under resilience and uh disaster management or all the climate change that we talk about they don't they come at a cost and uh that cost is something that always cannot it's not always affordable 
And that's why we don't see, you know, uh, solar roofing being done at a huge scale. So look at, you know, these big cities and big slums. Why don't we have solar roofs on all the rooftops if it, if it works, you know, in terms of cost? And there are a lot of alternate technology for roofing that is available. Uh, there are a lot of research that is done using paper mache or using so many different materials. But the cost when it comes to, because in that video, if you remember, that it talks about the cost that works for them. They're looking at between 500 to 1,000 rupees and that it works for a few years, then they're able to uh, you know, cut open certain parts and then rebuild certain parts at the time and the cost that works for them. And uh, a lot of new material that has come in market has not been able to work for that, that, that particular cost. And uh, it's not to say that we need to change the codes and standards, but it is to say that can we look at a way by which the codes and standards also work? I mean, not to put everything in black and white because there's a big gray area here we are talking about. And uh, so it's to say that, okay, well, if 1,000 rupees doesn't work for you, but here there's an alternative, which is at 1,200 rupees or 1,500 rupees, but that lasts longer and that may work for you is something that we are talking about. And that, what I'm saying is that, it's not that well versed in the market because one thing that I have really learned uh, in this practice is that in order to scale it up, it doesn't even require for any advertisements to be done. Because if it works for people in slums, if it works for one house, it would really work for everybody else, then it gets scaled up automatically. And that I, I think that is what where we need to work a little bit more. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, one question to Anshu, sir. Uh, from the page Karmakar, that uh, can we do the vulnerability mapping using the public domains like Google Earth or Bowen, or is that uh, not possible? Or students can be involved in that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, a lot of this is being done uh, using uh, publicly available data. I think one of the slides I showed you was from higher resolution imagery that we are using only to train a model. This is a program that is supported by Microsoft uh, and, and I extend an invitation to all, all the participants. If your institution at your local community level, you would like to do something like this, please just reach out to me. Uh, you can get my mail ID from NIDM uh, and, or I'll put it in the chat box and we are very happy to do that. So a lot can be done to start with from what is literally the imagery satellite imagery available on your phone no matter which os you use there is a map software and the satellite imagery you get there is a very good starting point to do local risk assessments we are very happy to share with you a few things that we've done and i'm sure you can uh, create many innovative ways of your own to do that thank you thank you sir these were the two questions raised by our participants now i invite dr rama ma'am for the closing remarks over to you ma'am yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's always a pleasure hearing to Dr. Anshu. And uh, every time we learn a lot uh, listening to you. So this time also the way you had put up the your three points, concluding points or takeaway points as you had put it, like we as a planner have to do lots of catching up with the technology and and, uh, and then the power of uh, community in building resilience and then uh, strengthening institutional resilience. So we all agree with this. These are the main takeaways of uh, this uh, uh, webinar. And um, Smruti, as always, uh, your talk also is very inspiring. And I have listened to your TED talk also, and uh, there you had focused on uh, how you had worked with the community in um, uh, in bringing up what actually they aspire, and then how we can bring their aspiration to actual planning. So I really like that, and you also had uh, emphasized on uh, the strength of uh, community in building up resilience, and we have to uh, capture this part like how they are coping up with the, all the disaster and this if we can bring that uh, or mainstream that in our planning that would be good and um, yeah that's it uh, and this is how i can sum up and uh, i would like to thank nidm also for uh, including us spa bhopal in this uh, uh, webinar and giving us opportunity to listen to uh, dr anshu and smriti and lots of our students have um, are attending this uh, webinar. Hope they have also learned from this. 
And in the end, I would like to thank the executive director of NIDM for um, having trust in us and giving us opportunity again and again. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. So uh, similar things from this side as well. And uh, gratitude to Professor Sridharan sir for uh, everything, including guiding us through this uh, webinar as well. So uh, thank you, Dr. Anshu. Thank you, Smriti, for everything. A wonderful presentations and uh, thank you to you Rama ma'am for uh, accepting and initiating taking this uh, initiative being partnered with the IDM so I request you to take formal vote of thanks to the dignitaries and the speakers uh, thank you sir so now we come to the end of our today's webinar on this occasion of world habitat day our webinar topic was in compliance to PM Agenda 8 and 9 on the topic of building urban resilience. And we shared our experiences and also the ex uh, initiatives through our speakers, patrons, and all the conveners. So uh, with this, I would like to start giving the gratitude to our honorable patrons for today's program. Uh, Executive Director Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal, sir, for always supporting us and bringing such important topics on the platform through online offline modes. I also thank Professor Dr. N. Sridharan, sir, Director of SPA Bhopal, for not only giving his uh, permission to conduct this program, but also sparing his valuable time and sharing his experiences, asking important questions to our speakers and uh, enlightening our participants as well. Thank you so much, sir. I thank the speakers, the two speakers today present here, Dr. Anshu Sharma and Smriti Zukra Zohari, ma'am. Thank you so much for uh, bringing this immense knowledge to our participants and making it very interactive as well. We went for more discussions, so which uh, I think the participants have highly benefited. So thank you so much for sharing these uh, on this on this important day of World Habitat Day and sharing your knowledge, sir. And ma'am, thank you so much. I thank the conveners, uh, Dr. Amir D. Khan and Dr. Rama Yupande, ma'am. Uh, thank you for joining hands together from SPA, from NIDM side, so that uh, you know, these pillars are the ones who create such uh, important programs and the success of the program. So I thank both the conveners. I thank the whole NIDM team and also the SPA team for collaborating and also giving the support offline and online both here. And thank you in the end to all the participants joining with us. Today we had a good participation and they also had given the great feedbacks. So thank you to each and everyone. Hope we have learned few important points through this webinar and uh, hope to have a great World Habitat Day today and also the rest coming days. Everyone, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to you, Yogita, for uh, nicely coordinating the show. Yes. So uh, thanks, okay. thanks to you as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Bye-bye.